This conference will now be recorded. Hello, dear Landau students. Welcome back to our YouTube channel. I hope you enjoy our first video from the educational video series. And as you know, our last topic was about um, climate and weather. But today we are moving to human geography and we are going to talk about uh, Africa. So as you guess from the cover photo, we are going to discuss uh, all geographical and historical uh, factors of this continent. Before starting our presentation, could you please ask yourself, what do you know about Africa? Do you know anything about its geography? Maybe you know something about its population? Well, I can give you a few seconds. You may pause the video, think about these questions, and um, try to get some predictable answers. If still you're struggling with this, well, I highly recommend you to watch this video because I think it is the best one that's made for you. So if you're ready, let's move on. The question is this, what do we know about Africa and why should we learn about Africa? Why this continent is so important for our world? Well, the continent of Africa is rich with the history of mankind. Some of the earliest archaeological discoveries of human development have been found in Africa, including ancient cave paintings, many thousands of years old. So that's why it's the reason why African continent is the world's oldest populated area. Now, let's learn more about the civilizations, population, uh, geography, and uh, let's conclude our presentation uh, with the uh, today's uh, development indicators of the whole continent. So, well, um, undoubtedly the African continent is the world's oldest populated area. And the reason behind this is, of course, um, the existence of lots of numerous civilizations. Africa has seen the rise and fall of many great civilizations and empires throughout its history. And the oldest and the longest lasting of these being the ancient Egyptians, who are still famous today for the pyramids and pharaohs. But before moving the ancient Egypt, I think uh, we should discuss uh, the first human origins, actually, first human migrations that derived from Africa. You have probably heard the claim that Africa is the birthplace of humanity, it's the birthplace of humankind. But before there were humans, or even apes, or even ape ancestors, there was only rock. <clears throat> Africa is the oldest and the most enduring landmass in the world. When you stand on the African soil, well, I hope you will get a chance to stand on the soil. Well, um, if you stand, the 97% of what's under your feet <clears throat> has been the place for more than 300 million years. Africa is the cradle of humankind and the place where the first human beings and their closest relatives, the gorilla and the chimpanzees, evolved five to ten million years ago. Uh, fossils <clears throat> found in Africa, they show that the modern human beings spread from this continent and the break from Africa into the wider world occurred around 10,000 years ago when a group numbering perhaps as few as 50 people, they migrated out of North Africa and along the shores of the Mediterranean and into the Middle East. Now, uh, we mentioned about the other civilizations and um, well, the Egyptians were not the only civilization to develop in ancient Africa. Important civilization that develops throughout the continent such as Mali Empire, Kingdom of Ghana, Kingdom of uh, Congo and Kenya. And we will learn it later, but now let's focus on ancient Egypt. As you know, it is one of the greatest and most powerful civilizations, not only in the history of Africa, but also in the history of the world. And it lasted for over 3,000 years. 
Well, historians usually group the history of ancient Egypt into three major kingdoms called the Old Kingdom, Middle and the New Kingdom. It was during this time that ancient Egypt was at its strongest. The times between these kingdoms are called intermediate periods. Well, you may ask why we are reviving these historical factors, because I think that before moving to the geography, we should learn how these historical events at actually reshaped the African continent and the geography of this continent. Well, why Egypt was so unique? What actually made it unique? Let's um, cover this. <clears throat> Let's talk about how was unique this civilization. So ancient Egypt was rich in culture, that's including government, religion, arts, and writing. The government and the religion were tied together. As the leader of the government, the pharaoh was also the leader of the religion. And the writing was also important in keeping the government running. But besides these facts, uh, Egyptians also made some, uh, um, let's say, important contributions to the history of Africa. Uh, they used moldy bread to help with infections, and they were one of the first civilizations to invent writing. They also used ink to write, and they, this paper they called papyrus. Uh, among ancient Egyptians, there were some scientists and mathematicians. These uh, people also had numerous inventions, including ways to build buildings, medicine, cosmetics, the calendar, the plow for farming, musical instruments, and even to space. But African history is not only limited with the ancient Egypt. We had lots of African empires and kingdoms, which are considered and called golden kingdoms. African empires is a term that we use in African studies to refer to a number of pre-colonial African kingdoms in Africa. And you know, guys, the um, structure of these empires were multinational. It means that lots of um, different people from different backgrounds actually ruled in these empires. Before colonial rule in Africa, there were 10,000 different states and autonomous groups with distinct language and customs. And um, Kingdom of Congo and Empire of Mali were be among these groups. The most powerful ones, as I mentioned, are the Kingdom of Congo and the Empire of Mali. So you see the Mansa Musa who was emperor of this um, empire in Mali uh, on your um, left side, and you see Alonso, the king of um, kingdom of Congo, on your right side. Uh, let's talk about Congo. So Congo actually um, was the first large political entity in the area. It was known to the history as Kingdom of Congo, and it's appeared in the 13th century. In the century before Portuguese exploration of West Africa, the Congo Kingdom developed in West Central Africa. Why exploring Congo is really so important for us? Because the Congo a really significant, like the Kingdom of Congo is really significant in historic context of African American heritage because the majority of all Africans enslaved in the southern English colonies were from the West Central Africa. So another powerful empire was the Mali Empire. This was located in Western Africa. It grew up along the Niger River and eventually spread across 1,200 miles from the city of Gao to the Atlantic Ocean. And its northern border was just south of the Sahara Desert. It covered regions of the modern day African countries of Mali, Niger, um, Senegal, Mauritania, and Gambia. Uh, the government of the Mali Empire was led by the emperor who was called the Mansam. Perhaps lots of people know about this person, but why this person was famous? Because of his trip to Mecca in Saudi Arabia. 
And some historians estimate that Mansa Muslimi have been the wealthiest person in the history. And the great wealth of Mali, guess from where they get the source of their wealth? Of course, it uh, came from the gold and salt mines. These are uh, the examples of uh, pre-colonial kingdoms and empire those existed in Africa before colonialism. But with the arrival of explorers in 19th century, the uh, Europeans actually put an end to all these empires and kingdoms, and then they reshaped whole continent by dividing themselves um, uh, by dividing them among themselves. Here you see the term scramble for Africa. Why do we use it? Well, let's clarify this. Um, as you know, um, a number of eager explorers from all over the world, they became drawn to Africa in 19th century. And they first uh, they were first European visitors, and when they came to the Africa, they actually made some brief expeditions into coastal settlements, but it wasn't long before the thirst to discover and exploit the unknown interior too cold. Um, European countries, they spent decades colonizing Africa, a fact that experts believe this actually um, governance has contributed to Africa's slow rate of development. So it means that the development, like the slow development of the continents actually related to the colonization. Uh, colonialism is a kind of act. Look, uh, let's just um, think about war is this. So let's see what is the real description behind this term. The colonialism is the act, yes, and it, by this act, a country or state exerts control and domination over another country or state. During a period lasting from 1881 to 1914 in what was known as the scramble for Africa. Now you know what is this definition of this term. And after this scramble of Africa, uh, several European nations took control over areas of African continent. But when it happened, and where it happened, it happened at the Berlin Conference in 1884, and most of Africa was split neatly into colonies. Uh, among these um, European countries were France, uh, Britain, uh, Germany, Portugal, Italy, Spain, and Belgium. Um, well, how actually they managed to um, take control of these um, territories? Well, with, I think, aggression. European colonizers, colonizers, they were able to attain control over much of Africa through diplomatic pressure, aggression, and of course, in military invasions. In fact, European countries competed with one another to see who could attain the most power and growth. At the height of colonization, only two countries of the continent had been untouched, which are Ethiopia and Liberia. So they were like independent and they even um, not colonized by Europeans. But uh, there was a time when all colonies, they realized that this is really lasting so long and we should actually finish it. And then they attempt to get their independence. And then the li liberation of Africa becomes a kind of reality. They always dream about the liberation of the whole continent, getting the independence, and finally they realize this. Every year, African countries, they celebrate the Liberation Day with a sense of pride, and I think that it is really necessary for all African people. Now let's attempt to define what is African liberation, and what are its parameters, and which social political forces 
pursue this liberation struggle. In the context of decolonization, like getting independence from the colonies, African liberation has been seen as process leading to independence from European colonial rule. All those that may be significant aspect of it, African liberation is a social cultural political process for self rediscover of African people, for um, self rehumanization of African people, and return with a dignity into human history. Colonialism and dependence on Europe removed uh, African people from history. And that's why liberation essentially is the return of the African people on the continent. Well, I think that you enjoyed um, what the historical factors that reshaped African continent at all. Now it is crystal clear for you why Africa is so poor and it's one of the underdeveloped regions in our world. Now, if you're ready, let's switch to the countries. Let's see what we have today in Africa. It is not only the second largest continent, but it's only the world's second populous uh, region in the world. We have 54 countries in Africa, and it was a total of more than 1 billion people living on the continent, which is 15% of the world's total population. We have lots of landlocked, tiny countries, and some of them are largest. Uh, than others. For example, Algeria, this country is among the 10 largest countries in the world. And um, compared to Nigeria, okay, with the size it's largest, but the most populous country in Africa um, is Nigeria. And with more than 185 uh, million people, the country is uh, only a third of the size of Algeria. The smallest country is Seychelles, which is an island in the Indian nation. And we have some landlocked countries in Africa and two tiny ones. As you see from the map, we have Swaziland and Lesotho. This is inside one country. This is a map of South Africa. And you see two landlocked countries. Uh, they are located within the South Africa. And these countries are all located in the interior of the continent and have neither access to the Atlantic Ocean, no to the uh, Indian Ocean. And for your information, guys, uh, this continent, Africa, is surrounded by two oceans, Atlantic and Indian. And these two tiny countries, Swaziland and Lesotho, they don't have any access. So that's why they're landlocked and tiny countries. Um, we talked about the countries, but now let's look deeply on the population. Uh, there are more than uh, 3,000 different groups of um, local people living in Africa, and um, they have their own language and the culture. And the majority of these countries, these people, is poor. Some of them really so poor, let's say, um, as you see from the map, we have some of them here. Democratic Republic of Congo, now with 74 million people. Um, Tanzania with 45 million people. And some of them really poor, but the poorest one is Burundi, somewhere here between two and nine, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, it is a tiny country, but this is the not only poorest one in Africa, but in the world. Um, but we have the developed countries, like the most developed countries and the richest countries are Seychelles here, uh, Libya, Mauritania, Algeria with 38 million people, Egypt with 84, Botswana, Namibia, and South Africa with 52 million people. It's estimated that about two um, southern different languages uh, are uh, spoken actually on the African continent. And many Africans, they speak several African languages and also often um, another European language. 
that's actually they um, got from these European um, explorers and um, countries. In many countries, people speak um, just because of this, just because of colonialism. They speak English, French, or Portuguese as an additional language. And these languages are often used in uh, communication uh, and, of course, in business. English is widely spoken in Africa, as many countries were formerly British colonies. Arabic, the language spoken in Northern Africa, is also used as official language. Um, well, Arabic is spoken by 170 million people on the continent. Uh, they have also their um, uh, local language, like Swahili, Hoso and the Berber, which is the nomadic language. So for your information, guys, if you don't know what does it mean, um, what does it mean like nomadic, nom nomads are the people who doesn't who, who don't have their um, permanent settlement. So they are traveling for getting food. So the nomad Berber is actually uh, the language that belongs to um, nomads. Um, over 25 or 25 percent of all languages are spoken only in Africa and with over 2,000 recognized languages spoken on the continent as I mentioned before and even let's see um, we have here yes estimated population we have here the different language and here we have some points about aging or young population I don't know, um, are they familiar for you or not? And we have predictions by 2015. Now let's talk about aging and young population. Now guys, um, if uh, in one country, the majority of population is under 20 or 25 maximum certain, means that um, the population is young in your country but if the majority of population is above than 60 or 65 it means that your population is getting older so you have aging population and this is actually depends on the living standards and um, the young population of africa is um, predicted to double to the 2.3 billion people by 2050. Can you imagine? It's really too much. Yes. We have also high fertility rates in Africa compared to other continents in the world. Um, fertility rates are basically um, referred to the um, illiteracy of women. Because if the woman is uneducated, she doesn't know how to space out between her children. And she doesn't know actually how to grow up them. So that's why um, they are giving uh, birth to minimum two, maximum to eight or even nine children um, in, whole, like in their life. Um, well, um, I think that this is one of the main reasons why still some of African countries are um, tackling with uh, poverty in the continent. Well, um, I think this is enough about the population. Now let's um, cover the geographical factors of the continent, which actually makes this continent unique. Okay, so Rim, yes. Well, uh, I think the geography of Africa helped to shape the history and the development of the culture and civilizations of the ancient Africa. Well, geography impacted where people could live and important trade resources such as gold and salt and trade routes that helped different civilizations to interact and develop. Africa is the world's second largest continent and it's covering about over than 30 million square kilometers. The Sahara is the largest desert in the world and it's bigger than continental USA. Well, it's amazing. And Africa is the world's hottest continent with deserts and drylands covering 
60% of land surface. Uh, some of them are really so famous, like Saharan and Namibian deserts. Africa is the world's second driest continent. Comparing to us, of Australia, of course, Australia is drier, but after Australia, Australia, it is the second one. Africa also has approximately 30% of the Earth's remaining mineral resources. The continent, mm -hmm, let's before switching the animal population, let's just um, let's just analyze the borders of the Africa. Well, the continent borders the southern half of the Mediterranean Sea, and the Atlantic Ocean is to the west, and the ocean, and Indian Ocean, is, ocean is to the southeast. And Africa stretches well south of the equator to cover more than twelve million square miles, making Africa the world's second largest continent. Uh, well. Here we have lots of interesting facts about um, geographical factors in Africa. Um, I don't know, do you know that over 1,270 large dams have been built along the continent's many rivers? We have also some uh, lakes in Africa, for example, Lake Victoria. It's the largest lake in Africa. And um, please, after watching the video, find the location of the lake and see what you know about this lake. You can and just search about the lake and put all your comment, uh, put all your comments actually below the video. The lake Victoria um, is the largest lake in Africa. That is the second largest freshwater lake in the world. And Africa also has the most extensive biomass burning in the world, yet it only emits about 4% of the world's total carbon dioxide emissions. Let's talk about biomes. Africa has 8 of the 11 major, major um, biomes and the largest remaining populations of lion, elephant, leopard and hundreds of other species. Well, major biomes actually are deserts, savannas, and rainforests. The country, the different countries in the continent, have also um, very, very colorful megafauna, like, um, let's say, like giraffes, zebras, gorillas, hippopotamus, chimpanzees, and even wild bees. They are unique to the continent and you can only find them there in Africa. Lake Malawi, uh, it has more fish species than any other freshwater system on the earth. And the Nile River is the longest river in the world with a total length of um, 6,650 kilometers. And Africa continent is home to the world's largest living land animal, the African elephant, which can weigh up to the, let's say, seven tons. It has also over 25% of the world's bird species. Um, these species, guys, are disappearing at an alarming rate, including many of Africa's most iconic animals. But together we can help, we can raise a money, we can actually donate, and we can uh, make them easier to tackle with this problem. The, the interaction between animals and their environments is the engine that keeps the planet healthy, not for all them, but for, actually for, for us too. But this is not one and only problem that African continent is tackling. Another and the, let's say the I think more important problem is the underdevelopment of African continent. Why it is world's poorest and underdeveloped continent? Because I think that the real reason behind it was the colonialism that they faced in 
let's say before 1960s. Yes, Africa is the world's poorest and most underdeveloped continent. And even with a continental GDP that accounts for just 2.4% uh, 2 of global GDP, so it means that they have low, low GDP. And um, what is dramatic, almost 40% uh, of adults in Africa are illiterate, so two thirds are women, it means two thirds of women. And adult literacy rates are below 50 in some countries like Benin, Burkina Faso, Chad, Ethiopia, Mali, Niger, Senegal, Sierra Leone, and the Gambia. What caused African underdevelopment is a complex issue. And European uh, past exploitation of Africa played a significant part. As I mentioned before, the real reason behind this was the explorers, um, let's say, willingness to um, exploit these all cont uh, countries, the whole continent. Before the Europeans arrived in Africa, Africa had a vibrant economic, social, and political structures. Just think about these empires. And they had, uh, let's say, the wealth. They had um, at least the source from where they got this health, wealth. These were several disturbed by um, Europeans to create wealth for themselves. And when economists look at African countries, they generally find their economies are really so weak. Yes, now this is the point. There are regularly, regularly many economic um, signs of this, like including a weak GDP, which measures the value of local production and its growth. It means that the growth of local production is low in Africa. And the exports of primary products and agricultural products, they're getting smaller. A low level of using modern industrial machines. And of course, a terrible national debt to richer countries and the gap between rich and poor getting bigger and bigger. A child born in Africa, just let's imagine that you are a child and you are just born in Africa. So if you're born in Africa, Today, you are still at the risk of not receiving a full, high quality education or mm, normal health care. An African child in school today continues to struggle to read, write due to poor quality of education services. Too many Africans continue not to visit the hospital due to lack of money. So they are sick, they are ill, they are dying, but they don't have enough money to go and visit the hospital. In other words, a child born today in those countries will be only 40% as productive at 18 years of age as one who completes their education and enjoys full health. Despite the widespread adoption of um, progress toward the sustainable development goals, uh, which actually are driven by UN or UNESCO, maybe you heard about them, um, Africa still like continues to be behind most of the world when it comes to the socioeconomic de development. So I hope that um, all international organizations, they will come together and they will help to Africa actually to tackle with these problems. And all these African um, students, they will receive a normal education and they will have enough money actually to visit their hospitals. Well, guys, it was all about Africa. That is, I think it's enough for today. See you uh, in different videos. But uh, before actually concluding my um, presentation, I would like to say thank you in different African accents. Thank you so much, guys. It was really a kind of joy for me. See you in different educational videos.